I'm just gonna do an icebreaker and then okay. give it to you for Andrew. Uh, before we hear from Andrew about the Salmon Falls Watershed Collaborative, we thought we'd introduce ourselves so you're all familiar with each other and apologize that we do not have name tags today. But that means um, we don't expect you to remember anybody's name so you can reintroduce yourself multiple times. My name is Annie Cox and I work at the Wells National Estuarine Research Reserve System. I'm Rachel Roulard. I'm with the Piscataqua Region Estuaries Partnership. We're the national estuary program that covers uh, southern New Hampshire, coastal New Hampshire, and um, this part of um, Maine, across the river, Salmon Falls. <laughs> Trevor Matera, also with the Pisca Piscataqua Region Estuaries Partnership. I'm Jeannie Vineyard. I live in Hudson, Massachusetts. It's kind of complicated <laughs> I'm here, so if you want to know that story, I'll tell you that at some point. But happy to be here. <laughs> I'm Ross Rostrom, an intern with the New Hampshire Department of Environmental Services. I'm Melissa Paley. I'm the Great Bay Piscataqua Waterkeeper uh, with the Conservation Law Foundation. Dan Pru. I work for the City of Rochester's Water Treatment Plan. Zeke Lapierre, Sam. Sam Carrier, one of the operators at the Rochester Water Treatment Plan. Good morning, I'm Carl Honkinen. I'm a watershed forester with the U.S. Forest Service State and Private Forestry. Regina McGuire, no official title. <laughs> Mike Plasiak, Maine Rural Water. Peter Berenger, U.S. Forest Service, State and Private Forestry. Jeff Winder, City of Rochester, volunteer. I'm a land protection guy and I got a project to sell you today <laughs> on the Sand Falls River, three miles. Okay. Uh, Chris Port, Wells National Estuarine Research Reserve. Hi, Kyra Jacobs with the U.S. Environmental Protection Agency's Drinking Water Protection Program. And I've been working with this woman and some other folks in this circle on this project for almost 10 years. And I brought maps. Okay. Right. Tom Gilmore, Great Works Regional Land Trust. I've been on the board for eight or nine years. Alice Lynch, uh, Keller Williams Coastal Realty, and I also live on the river, so just curious and want to know more. Uh, I'm Ben Woodman with GZA Geo Environmental out of Portland. Abigail Line with the Piscataqua Region Estuaries Partnership. And I'm Andrew Madison. I'm the Source Protection Coordinator for the New Hampshire Department of Environmental Services. Um, so I wanted to take a moment and thank everyone for coming today. Um, this is the fourth annual Salmon Falls Safari that we've had. Um, every year we rent a bus like this or get a caravan of vehicles to tour around the watershed. Take a moment to look at either special properties that need protecting or to talk about projects we've worked on as partners to help protect water quality for the citizens in both states. Um, as Kyra mentioned, the collaborative is a little over 10 years old, and in 2011, we won the U.S. Water Prize from EPA. Uh, no, in 2012, we won. That's why we I was going... We won a national award from the U.S. Water Alliance. Yes, the Water Prize. Yeah, the U.S. Um, Go to Cairo for the water price. Um, <laughs> On the ball might show up this afternoon. I was living in Indiana at the time. Um, anyways, the Salmon Falls Collaborative is an informal collaborative of multiple state, federal, and local agencies, as well as nonprofits and academia that work together to protect water quality in the Salmon Falls region. We work on a number of projects together and we try to prioritize our activities towards protecting drinking water for the residents of two states. So, that being said, why don't we all go ahead and get on the bus and go to our first stop, which is going to be the farm. Mm -hmm. okay. Just so, just a quick stop here. I, we were kind of blowing right by um, this nice oak stand that's about 60 years old. It was actually clear cut um, in the early 1960s. And um, so a lot of the trees that are around 10 inches are, are really nice young oaks that will become um, valuable not only for 
timber, but for wildlife, um, it'll, it'll just be a pretty area. Very carefully thinned out um, in 2015. And um, so I, this is what we would call an even aged stand. All, all the trees are about the same age because it was all clear cut. It all came up at once. So we're gonna see something a little bit different just down the road here. Okay. Yeah, everybody's ready to rock. I've been in that bus too long. Yeah. <laughs> all right. So the, now you're standing in a quite a different type of forest. Um, when I when I first walked in here about six years ago, it was a wall of beech trees. Just you could barely see the forest for the trees for a tired expression. But uh, so it's been very carefully thinned. And what I've discovered as I really looked at it was that there's really a variety of ages. So I, we made a little board here of um, some of the, the trees. There, in each one, there was, you know, 1993, this small white pine, which is what you see here in the foreground, about 25 years old now. <clears throat> and then there's trees that started in 1980, 1945, 1920. And as you go back, there was always some kind of disturbance, usually logging. Um, there's a lot of history here. Before all of this, well, let's keep going back, 1896, back to 1860. There's a few trees out here um, that are 150 years old or more. And <clears throat> hemlocks, um, sometimes oaks. Some big trees? Yep, there's some. Are, no, not, nothing that's a champion size tree. It's, it's interesting that sometimes a, a uh, innocuous looking little tree, a 14 inch hemlock can be 180 years old. So it doesn't always track with diameter. Um, it's, there's just a look to them though. And so anyway, so that, that's one of the things I really work with is I, I try to work with developing um, mixed age forests. And, and so you're really seeing it here. You, you know, you have this older set of pines that are about 115, 120 years old. Um, there's mid age, what we call pole wood, which are Trees like this, this size, you know, that are maybe 60 to 75, 80 years old. Um, there's young pole wood that's uh, 35, 40 years old. And then there's younger trees and plus small openings. So you can see some light openings. I just use small pockets to, to grow new trees. So there's a whole set of seedlings that are started now. And so there's always something coming that way. And really try to keep all the real old trees. Um, so you have this um, nice variety of trees and canopy layers for wildlife. One of the important partners for all of this is um, NRCS, Natural Resources Conservation Service. Kelly, Kelly might say a word or two, but that's helpful when we're thinning young areas like this, uh, we have to actually pay for that work. And yep. so through Kelly. NRCS, hi. Yeah, I'm Kelly Boland. I'm the state biologist for the NRCS, Natural Resources Conservation Service, um, under the USDA. And uh, we work with private um, and funded by the Farm Bill. A uh, new one's come out and we're getting all of our new rules right now. Uh, one of our priorities is drinking water protection areas, is working, putting some of our funding towards drinking water protection that's actually required. And I think that's a good thing. So we'll have um, areas that we're focusing a little bit more of our funding towards um, to make sure we get to that 10%. We also have some wildlife goals as well, um, along with all the other things we do. But one of our biggest programs, especially in New Hampshire, is our forestry program. And we fund forest management plans. And I don't know if we funded the one for this piece of land, but we do for private lands yes. fund forest management plans. So those cost money. Private foresters need to go and cruise the, the forest so we can uh, help fund those. We um, also fund the activities within that plan that would cost otherwise cost the landowner money. Uh, it's a competitive process. But So things you'll see today, like some of the tree thinning, um, some of the, you know, if we do snag trees, dead trees that wildlife live in, we can do some of that. We do early successional habitat, and we'll see some of that. That's the young forest um, that grows up, and, you know, that's a priority for us because it's a priority for our partners. So it's all about working together, um, and we have offices across the state, and our local office here is in Epping. So, yeah, we, we love to work with them. Um, 
communities and sorry, some bugs swarming around my head right now. <laughs> and uh, it's it's a pleasure working with landowners um, like Cindy and, and with Charlie. We have a really good relationship. So, um, so yeah, I can uh, answer questions about our programs if you have any of those. How much money are you charging to the Santa Falls River, or is it competitive the whole state? Um, it's competitive the whole state uh, at this point. There's different pots of money like forest land funding. Um, there's agri We also work with agricultural landowners, obviously, so some of our funding is going towards that. I don't have the numbers right now. I can get them to you about exactly what we, we spent last year um, within the Salmon Falls. Did they cut the funding for the drug because of the new administration? Um, I think it, we're actually looking pretty good, and maybe um, you want to speak to that a little bit more. but. You know, we're looking pretty good this year because okay. we, we do work with private landowners. We do work with working lands, um, people who are producing food, uh, producing, you know, forest products. And, and we have all sorts of priorities um, under that umbrella. So, so we look, we're looking pretty good for this year. So we... Uh, Okay, keep on yeah, rolling. Keep on. keep on walking so we can... Yeah. Any questions, feel free. But. Yeah. Any questions about forestry? This so I, I, I'm going to hold up a map, hand-drawn map, of this tract, which is about 275 acres. And you see all the blue along the top. That's the uh, Branch River, um, which is, flows directly into the Salmon Falls River just below here. The Seaman family also owns all the land on the other side of this. So that's over a mile of river. Really great. All protected, locked up. And uh, the, the big aquifer we were talking about is most of it's on the other side of the river. There's a little bit on this side, and we're actually going to have a chance to hike on that. Can everybody hear me okay? Should I? Yeah? Okay, good. So, um, and I don't know if you can see this. We started here, as I look at a turkey vulture up there in the sky, circling, and we are here in this little green opening. Um, I, it's nice to put in an opening when you have two, three hundred acres of forest, just as a little bit of a differentiation in habitats. Um, so this is a small wildlife clearing. Sometimes we will make larger ones. At Kelly, we worked on several over in Maine for the uh, New England cottontail, an endangered species. Those are much larger openings. But anyways, that, the forest around this has so many good trees, I hate to cut those down. You know, they're, they're growing, they're, didn't want to mess with that. So, but this area had a lot of aspen and, and other trees. So it just kind of made, made it just right for a little wildlife clearing, which is about two and a half acres or so. So not too big. And on top of it, as it was very thick, as I began to go through it, I realized there's actually some nice sugar maples and basswoods and oaks. So there's, I actually left scattered trees through it, which is okay too. There's, there's certain species of birds like towhees we were talking about and chestnut-sided warblers I actually like a few scattered trees through the opening. But all this dense cover is also great. And, uh, and as you were talking about yeah. before, you were, you know, talking about how the, the, a lot of the land in southern Maine and New Hampshire was cleared back, you know, during the, the agricultural boom. And then it was abandoned. And so we got a lot of even-age stands, which provide something for some wildlife, but getting inclusions of um, some young forests, and, you know, opening up some of the canopy to allow young trees to grow has multi multiple benefits. It, it not only allows those trees to, you know, replace themselves eventually, but it provides a different type of habitat for birds that might like the mid canopy. This is for birds that may need this really dense, thick area in order to hide their nests and other types of critters. Um, and not only do you know, birds, we talk about birds a lot because they're easy to see, but um, another priority we have going on in the state in New England across the country are pollinators. And as we walk, we will see some of the, um, you know, flowering plants, goldenrod, late season, really important for monarchs. Um, so that providing that pollen and nectar throughout the season can be provided sometimes by planting flowers <coughs> at different times. Willows are, are an early season pollinator plants, one of the earliest, it's a really important one. So if you can mix willow into your management, that's really good. Um, but we can also have the later season um, habitat here. So 
of course, as you see, it's not pleasant for a human to walk through, but it's really great for a bird to nest in because what wants to, you know, everything's going to want to eat that nest. So if you can provide places like this when you do forestry, and this is all outlined in their forest management plan, which they had in place before starting to cut the yeah. trees. So you kind of have a vision, a 10 to 15 year vision of what you want. Ideally, we're looking 50 years ahead, yeah. but that's what the land protection is doing. You know, you got, you got this forever, and now what you do with it, um, you know, it's out. And when it comes, when their time to pass comes, you never know what's going to happen. So it's really important that these uh, landowners sit down with their families and have honest discussions early on mm -hmm. to uh, what their wishes are for the future and how they want to see the land managed before who knows what happens. And, uh, and, and then you might be in a fire sale situation and you sell it because you need money and you didn't think about the long-term repercussions of that. But the other comment I wanted to make as a, again, my focus is watershed forestry. And this is like the ideal forest that we love to see for water supply protection because it's resilient. Resilient is the new buzzword these days. And a resilient forest is one that can help protect water quality because you've got a lot of diverse species. You've got oaks, you've got hemlocks, you've got pines, you've got maple. You get a lot of diverse sizes, so they're not all one size. It's not a monoculture, just pine or, or just oak, whatever. It's a, it's a nice mix because if you ever had some kind of catastrophe, like a hurricane of 38, for example, really decimated this area, or you have a huge insect infestation that could wipe out an entire species, you've got other ones that'll fill their place. So it's that resiliency that we really try and stress, and actually. Kyra and I are helping put together a workshop this fall for water suppliers to learn about managing forests to be resilient in this changing time of, of, of climate. So uh, yeah. if any of you water suppliers are interested in that, talk to us today. It's going to be November 6th, 7th and 8th in Central Massachusetts. And it's free nice. and it's hosted by the yeah. Forest Service. Nice. We can help give you details US on that. Service. Thank you, Carl. Those nice are job. great, great comments too. Because that's you exactly. Hear me say that. No, <laughs> no, but it, we we think alike exactly. So very good, very good. Thank you. And one thing that was interesting of your trees in New England, um, northern New England, grow slowly. You know, um, uh, an oak tree might put on two inches per decade. You know, but one one thing that's a bit of an exception are, are these aspen that you can see here in the foreground, right behind the the sign here, that some of them are pushing 20 feet tall. Those were cleared in 2015, so four years. Look at how they shot right up. Four years. So, They're twice my height. Yeah. Three times my height. <laughs> Three times, right? So, but that's really great habitat. There. Will this so. clearing be managed as a clearing, or do you sort of let the natural succession go on and sort of move a clearing around just to keep oh it that, That's a great habitat. question. You, it can be that way, but in this case, this will be managed as a clearing. And often they are. It just has a nice mix of species for that, aspen being one of the important pieces of that. It, and that's truly an early successional species. You know, you hear that word a lot. And basically those are the tree species and shrub species that that come in when a an opening is first made uh, like a field is abandoned more more like that not so much stump sprouts from older trees like oaks but so aspen gray birch black cherry those are all charlie got a question on any clear lots have you put apple trees or things like that in there for wildlife we haven't we haven't you could do that you could enhance i like sumac as a, a great species for yeah, yeah. Sumac is a great native species that uh, can be a great enhancer. Some of the dogwoods are great. Yeah, so there's, there's 50 chestnut trees. Yeah, there are chestnuts. We did. Yeah, we're not going to have a chance to. You yeah, we'll probably have heard of the, the sad story of the American chestnut, and um, so fortunately, some still sprout from the ground. Here it is, 90 years later, since they were the, almost a century end of my life I'd love to see the the reintroduction of this species back to the forest because there's been some huge efforts to, to crossbreed uh, resistance to the to the blight and that's been going on since the 1950s and some real things like that but how do you actually bring them back to the woods how do you get them back there so as part of one of the, the harvests, I have these small regeneration openings I had the science director from the American Chestnut Foundation she came and, and toured it and, and she got us seedlings which I planted this spring 
um, in one of the in two of the openings. So, uh, it, not exactly what I expected. This sloped area, and this is the about a mile of frontage along the Branch River. Okay. And we're gonna we're gonna loop this way. So. You can see, uh, it, you know, the, we, we didn't talk too much about the soils, but up, up above where we started, where, where the main road is, that's the White Mountain Highway, and that's a very old road. I mean, that, that was laid out in probably the 1600s, early 1700s, but it probably was a Native American trail even. And that was the best farmland up on the ridge. You know, you see the nice farmhouses. So nice ag soils in the beginning. Part. As we come down the hill, it's more of a glacial till. It's just a mishmash of big rocks, middle rocks, but good soils as well. It grows, trees grow very well. And then you get, as we go downhill towards the river, the river's down below me in the background, um, there's like these steps and there'll be little pockets and rich pockets of soil. So we find a more of a diversity of species and there's indicator trees, indicator species, that say, yeah, this is good soil, I'm happy here, you know? So a couple here, white ash, of course, likes a decent soil. That's why there's a lot of it in Vermont. They like the wood soil? They like a nice soil, a nice sweet soil with, with moisture, okay. sometimes wet. Um, here, does anybody wanna say what this is? Tree. Tree? <laughs> this little, actually, here's another one. A little bit easier to see. And it, I'll give you a hint, it doesn't grow very large. A little bit bigger than this, but not huge. No. Cherry? Nope. It's in the birch family, believe it or not, but not at all like a birch you would think of. Um, you want me to say it? Okay. Hop, hop, hop horn beam. What? Hop horn beam. Hop horn beam. Hop. Hop. Hop horn beam. Yeah, so that's just a really nice, pleasant tree to have and likes a, a nice soil. You know, we'll find out in the richer spots. And then, when you say nice soil, you mean like high nutrient? High nutrients. High nutrient, unlike, you know, some of the sandy, gravelly, like where nutrients would be washed out. Right, yeah, like, exactly. Or like, sweeter, like a higher pH. Yeah. Yes, <laughs> yeah, slightly sweeter soil, exactly. So, like over the aquifer, yeah. sandy outwash soils, you probably wouldn't find the hop horn beam there. Nor would you find these, these here. Um, Anybody want to guess on these? You, one of the things is, do you know what that is? The, the holes? Here's a porcupine hanging out in the tree up there. Nice. Hey, couldn't, <laughs> thanks for showing up. Perfect. Put it there. <laughs> <laughs> it's up on the crotch there. And this is a sign of another species, another animal. The, the little holes through up and down this. Woodpeckers. It's uh, the sapsucker, yellow belly. Yep. Yeah. Yep. So this, these are basswoods. Okay. I, really nice trees to rot for cavities. Yeah, dent trees, as Jeff said. Yep. So really nice to have that. And then what else did I see here? I think. They don't live that long either. No. Nope. That's a good sized basswood there. Oh, here's another one that's that likes a sweet soil is um, sugar maple, right? So that that's a so. All of this is part of the whole picture, this resilience idea and, and lots of species. Um, so, onward. Yeah, and that's, that's kind of a constant thing for trees. You know, that, you know it's, uh, I know, and then the porky. Oh, that was not planned. <laughs> All right, so another quick stop here as we get closer to the river. Promise you there's a river on the end of this trail. <laughs> Um, so I, you've been walking through forests that's all been harvested and you know a lot a lot of it is um, you can see a, a big pine tree behind you here one of the few that that has survived from way back that, that I look at that as it tells you what the land can grow you know trees that size and bigger and at one time there were many trees that size um, when this was the natural forest um, but you know certainly as a as a goal we, we look at that as an example of what we would like to have here someday, 50 years, 100 years from now, trees, many trees like that, not just a single one. Um, and you can see many candidate trees around you of various species that will do that. That's part of it though. And the other part of it is this little stuff. You can see all the little pine trees coming in and 
uh, birches, maples, oaks, and you can see uh, a slightly older generation of trees. Those are kind of over top, but there's openings out through that forest where there's young growth coming in. Really important to have that coming along. That's all part of it, because a, a forest that's only tall trees like that, certainly it's okay to have a pockets or even a stretch of it, but if the whole 300 acres were like that, one big hurricane and it's, it's gone, you're starting over. So we want to have a, a very variety of ages. And that's the resilience. We've done everything, and part of that was for the demonstration <clears throat> of it. We've done all the types of harvesting here. <clears throat> we, this side was done with a cable skitter. It's kind of the traditional way, a chainsaw and a cable skitter. This side was done with cut-to-length equipment, which is um, two pieces of equipment, high-tech, $1.5 million altogether in equipment, just the two pieces, um, very carefully done. There's um, other areas that we've done with biomass, and each has really, if it's done right, they really can be very helpful in a lot of ways. There's areas that have a lot of beach that are just sort of taken over the forest, young ones. And I like to use the biomass in some of those sections because, yeah. How do you kill the little beaches? The timber cut we did, that mechanized one. Yeah. I got little beaches everywhere. I'm sick and tired. Yeah, you, you either have to keep coming back and cutting them down or you can mix that with an herbicide treatment. So, so far we haven't used herbicides here. We've just done mechanical cutting down. So um, if you do a herbicide treatment as a landowner, you can do it yourself, but otherwise you need to hire a licensed herbicide applicator. So, and in the background, you can see, it's not exactly intended as a shelter wood, but that's a type of harvesting method where you have dense young growth of pine underneath older trees that are, have been opened up so there's light on the young, younger trees. So. Um, so that was just an area. So we're going to kind of loop around and as we walk, we're going to go into a big opening um, and you'll see very dense pine in the opening. It's, it's so easy to get that back when it's wide open. Um, it's, so, it's so easy to get pine, a lot of these species that are sun loving to establish. It's much more difficult to work with a canopy, but that's what we're trying to do. We're, we are doing it. That's, that's how we manage this the overhead canopy to have the mixed ages. So. <laughs> you came from Midcoast, Maine. Yeah. Where is Where, what town? Uh, what? What, what is it? It's a town called Woolwich. Oh, Woolwich. So here we are. This is um, where the Branch River kind of forms a delta and goes through these really nice uh, grassland wetlands, shrub, shrub swamp, um, sort of peppered with forested swamp, a lot of snags, great habitat, a, a, quite a large area. Um, and this is where it eventually uh, flows into the Salmon Falls River. So we're really quite close to the confluence of the two rivers here. Um, and as we walk the trail, we're actually go where it's more of a channel river. So we're, we're gonna see that too. But just a great spot. I mean, this just, there's wildlife of everything here. The waterfowl are great. The, we have eagle nests not too far from here. Um, songbirds, every, everything, it's, it's, it's just a great thing. Um, the the uh, semen family, part of the land is everything you see pretty much all the way across. The, the peninsula that we've been talking about with the aquifer, that property is all the upland beyond this wetland. So, so this is all protected land. And it's good, good view. Not quite seeing Maine there, but. Not quite. The next view I think we'll see Maine. Next so we'll see Maine. We'll see Maine. We, we don't want you guys to feel too far from home, so. Property. Yes, so yeah, that's point. where you take it out, yeah. Okay. Yeah, it seems like the, the reservoir is doing well this year, right? Oh, yeah, yeah we're, like, no, we're lucky. We're so, this so, is our last stop, yeah. yeah. The hill over there is Maine. Yuck. Over there? <laughs> Great. In Lebanon. Yep. Lebanon. 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 Jeez, I'm crazy. New, New Hampshire says yeah. Lebanon. Yeah, that's what we said. New Hampshire, yeah. yeah. <laughs> Lebanon, I gotta... <laughs> You know? Yeah. Oh, and it's. That one. Uh -huh.
<laughs> oh. Thank you all for coming to the Berwick Water Treatment Facility, as you see. Um, it's very small. It's not as large and grand as uh, Summersworth or Rochester. Uh, but we have our work cut out for us here. Um, the Salmon Falls River is our only source of water. Um, we're not interconnected with any other entity, so uh, source water protection is uh, really high on our list. Uh, this is Chris Wiseman. <laughs> he is our um, chief operator and department head for the town of Berwick. Yes, we're a lot smaller than Summersworth, and one of the fascinating, amazing facts is that even though our intakes both go into the same river and only a quarter mile apart, the water is different. Not in a huge way, but sometimes when we're having a problem, we check with them and see what they're uh, measuring in the water, and it's significantly different. We think it might have to do with what happens between here and there. Maybe there's a groundwater source or um, low-lying land that feeds into the river, or it might be the depth of the intake, because uh, particularly now, we're getting into the season where the flow slows down and the water can stratify. You get that warm layer that you feel when you go swimming in a pond. It's really nice, but your feet are surprisingly cold. And it's frigid down low, and it can mean anoxic conditions developing down near the bottom. Sucking manganese out of the sediments and forcing us to uh, treat it. So, uh, some yes. people may not know what anoxic means, so maybe okay. for the non-water people you can explain. Yeah. Uh, lack of oxygen. <laughs> uh, the Salmon Falls River has dissolved oxygen in it, not a whole lot, but enough, and when it stratifies, the upper layer is warm and has oxygen, and as you go further down, there's less and less oxygen. It's not being turned over at all. It's not a fast-flowing stream. So. That leads uh, microorganisms to shift their life cycle from uh, basically <laughs> um, eating dissolved manganese and uh, regurgitating uh, solid manganese to eating solid manganese and putting out uh, dissolved manganese. And that's the stuff that's harder to treat. So when this plant was built 20 years ago, we added six chemicals. Now we add nine chemicals. And um, we've got more work to do, too. It's um, a difficult surface water source. It's unusual to have high levels of manganese in a river water source, for instance. The, the things that are in the river water that our customers don't want to be in the water they get out of their tap are too small to be filtered out. We have to add to chemicals like aluminum sulfate and polymers in order to electrochemically, uh, like magnets, uh, attach to these little tiny things and clump them together in a bigger glob, which we can easily filter out through our uh, multimedia filters. This recycling system behind us here um, there's a bag that's uh, pumped up with water pressure there, and water is seeping out through the, the, the pores, the um, weave of the fabric, and solids are being kept inside the bag. Those solids are from our filter system, and we have to remove them so that we can recycle that water. We mix it with the river water, and it goes back through the plant. It's not a perfect system. It adds some things back into the water, but we needed to start that system with only two weeks notice and we designed it and built it in two weeks. One bag's being used, the other one isn't. Eventually they'll become full and currently the bag is destroyed and the rest is taken away in trucks to a landfill in South Portland. Um, it's yeah, it's eco-main. Yeah, yeah. Yep. And they recycle it and they use it for, they take the sludge and they mix it uh, with dirt and they sell it off as uh, as fertilizer and, and fill for like turf farms and that sort of thing. Oh, and we're very happy to say <laughs> there's no PFAS in it. <laughs> very simple system, but it saves us and our, it saves our customers a lot of money in the end. Yeah. Um, 
the problem with the treatment down at the sewer district is just like the rest of the town. We lost prime tanning and they had the ability to treat the water when they had all of their system running, but now it's not cost effective to them to treat our waste, our hydro solids um, because the alum adjusts their pH and adjusts their treatment in a way that they can't handle. So we take that sludge and that alum and we push it into these bags because that's what it is. It's, it's alum sludge. And we have to use alum in order to get rid of um, total organic carbons. And that is what creates disinfection byproducts, which we have had a problem with in the past. So, Yeah, that's the clearest line from water quality to uh, bad results, bad health results, and bad money results, which is high organic matter needs to be removed from the water. And if it isn't, and then you add chlorine to it, the molecules recombine into things like chloroform. Organic matter rises up in the summer. It can be removed in many different ways. I am standing on the 500 year flood line. <laughs> yeah, that's true. Our 100 year flood line is at the gate. How close so, did it come a couple years ago? At the bottom of that gate, gate right there, yeah. These two filters work independently of each other, so one can shut off and we can run the other one if we need to. Most of the time we run them at a very low level all, most of the day. We're, we have the ability to um, not have to run 24 hours a day. Uh, we have a 1.1 million gallon uh, standpipe up on the top of Pine Hill, which feeds the town uh, through gravity uh, when the plant is off. So we can do our eight or ten hours on a, on a good day. On a bad day, we can be here a lot longer. Um, but it, it is a, a fast-moving um, plant. From the time it leaves the river to the time it ends up in our, in our tanks, which we're standing on, the tanks are just below us here, uh, it, it's what, a half hour, 45 minutes. Mm -hmm. um, it takes from this side, there's a big tank over here where these filters dump into into the ground. It goes through a bunch of apples where it's chlorinated, fluoridated, and um, orthophosphated. Yeah. These are three chemicals we add. Um, orthophosphates for lead and copper, so we don't um, leach lead and copper into the system. It kind of coats the pipes. It also adds a polyphosphate which uh, sequesters the dissolved manganese that's left over after the filter, so you don't get that deep colored water which um, we try to avoid at all costs. <laughs> but sometimes the tea color water is a lot safer than, than other water. Like we, could, we could not treat it or add chlorine, as much chlorine, but it wouldn't be as safe. You're, you're safer to have the color than you are to get rid of all of it sometimes. Mm -hmm. you know, we we mm -hmm. try to find that balance. You know, if we had mm -hmm. an accident in the river, we have the ability to shut off and wait for it to pass us. Whereas a summer's worth only has about a four hour window before they have to open back up again. They will lose all their water in about four hours. We have 12, 24 hours. A big tank on the hill. Had well test sites in this area back in the 90s. Mm -hmm. And they found that um, there was only one well in the area that, that would fit the description that so it would be protected. You could have a well head protection. It only got about 350 gallons a minute. We push out, we're, we're doing 450 gallons a minute and, and we're stable. So it didn't have the yield we needed. And it's also very far away, like two or three miles away. So it would cost more money to put in a line down here than it would just to build a new treatment plant in that other area. So what yep. we have is the river. It's, it's all we have and we really need to protect it. it it's for the mm. near future, this, mm. is, this is what we got. We throw as much money as we can towards it to, to keep um, the water flowing in town. Question. Emergency response. In case there's accidents, oil, or gas, do you have the apparatuses here for the fire department? Emergency response on the river? State Wait. of Maine and the state of New Hampshire spend money to do an emergency response drill on the river. Is What do we do in the event of a spill? That's is, right. I mean, really, it depends on a dozen factors. Mm -hmm. um, you can boom it to move it around, but the overall thing is if something spills in the river, you wait for it to go by and then you start up again. Yeah, that's what we're hoping, yeah. that it's something that, that would be a situation like diesel fuel, which is what we use yeah. as an example, 
So uh, we all saw the train go by. Yeah. That runs all along this river. It crosses our river just above our intake structure. If anything was to happen to that, we're lucky enough maybe to have enough time for it to go down the river from us. So we, we could shut the plant off. You know, if it happens and they don't call us right away, say a half hour goes by, it's already in our filters. It's already too late. That, that's kind of why the communication aspect is really what we tried to do with that emergency response drill was test and exercise communications between the state of Maine and the state of New Hampshire. Because both states draw off the river, both states are going to have to respond, and both states need to be talking to each other in the event of an emergency so that they know what's going on, they can coordinate the efforts to protect the river. Thankfully, we haven't had a situation where we really needed that to happen. We needed that coordinated response, but hopefully now there's a framework in place to facilitate that communication between the two states, as well as between the fire departments mm -hmm. and their respective water departments, if a spill should happen. When was that table talk? A little over a year ago. Uh, Susan Crow was a major part of that. And I, I just want to add a little additional context. So I work throughout New England for the Source Water Protection Program for EPA. We have 4,000 water supplies. So obviously we, EPA, the state folks, can't work with every water supply. But less than 50 of those 4,000 water supplies in the whole New England region are rivers. Because rivers are very hard to use as a water supply because of all the things Chris and Starr just said. What they, the job they have is so challenging, and that's why we invest a lot of time and resources in helping the Salmon Falls um, well, utility, really appreciate water it. utilities because <laughs> they have, in my opinion, the hardest job. They don't have a reservoir like Providence Water with a big fence around it that was protected 100 years mm. ago. You, know, you don't have the luxury for Sebago Lake. So every time you come in in the morning, you have a different, it's different. water yeah. that you're dealing with. I was going to ask if you could just star address like, you know, what, what would happen if the land we just were walking on today in the woods, you know, one of the things we focus on for the Salmon Falls project is land conservation. What if the entire river looked like the Merrimack River in New Hampshire and in uh, Massachusetts and it was all subdivisions? How would mm -hmm. that change your water quality? Mm -hmm. I would say we'd probably put a connection to Summersworth and used over. <laughs> I mean, we, we, it might come to that someday that we can't use the river anymore, but we have a large a uh, water treatment facility across the river, it's in a different state. Um, I don't know how that would work out, but we, we would have to find somewhere else to get our water, and we're not going to get it from an aquifer here, so we would have to interconnect with somebody that had wells. And just because you switch from the river to a well doesn't mean you're going to get rid of the manganese or the arsenic. There's mm. other issues with well water, with groundwater, that we're already dealing with here. People are in town are like, why don't you just get a well? And we're like, well, the well's going to have manganese too. What's the point of spending all that money? Static mixer. What is it? Static mixer. Static mixer. <laughs> two sections. The first part of the section where the water comes in through that pipe, it gets pushed up, up here through a bunch of little plastic beads, which mixes it even more and creates plop. And then that water goes over into the weir. Sorry. It goes over to the weir and it ends up in our filter area. And this is a mixed media filter. It has anthracite which is just crushed coal uh, underneath that is sand and underneath that is garnet it polishes the water it goes from large to small and it um, filters through these clamshells underneath and goes down into our finished water so after it it kind of looks like this but when it goes through this it's nice clean clear water if you can believe that <laughs> so small though this is it <laughs> But it, it has the ability to do up to 750 gallons a minute each. We only push about 250 gallons each because that's all we need right now. But we, we can, if, if things were to build up at Prime Tanning or if we wanted a couple more breweries in town, we can kick it up a notch and be able to handle that. What's the population that you serve? I heard a thousand connections, but is it like I have a thousand, a thousand? Con 
Yes, it is less than 10,000. We don't have, there's a lot of rules we don't have to follow because we're smaller. Yeah. We use chloramination, yes. We use um, a, a mixture of ammonia and chlorine out in the system. Not only does that um, offer us the ability to make the um, disinfection lasts longer in the system. It also stops the uh, ability of the, it stops the water from being able to make disinfection byproducts. As soon as that ammonia hits, disinfection byproducts stop being made. Problem is disinfection, the, the chloramination takes a very long time to, to dis deactivate um, viruses. So it would take a lot more space and time for us to do that at the beginning of the headwaters. At the back of these filters, we actually use um, free chlorine because it works much faster. It only takes about six hours to... Um, we use free chlorine to disinfect and then the, as the water is going out through the finished water pumps, it adds ammonia and that is a ratio that um, makes monochloramines, and we use monochloramines for disinfection. Why do you mix the two like that? That's the whole idea, yeah, you gotta mix them. <laughs> it's, a, it's a perfect ratio, because once you get into the ratio change, you can make dichloramines or trichloramines, which are much better for disinfection, but they have a smell to it, like a uh, pool. Uh, is a typical pool water smell, and people can have reactions to that. It can be, you know, eyes burning, skin burning, and whatever. It's just a lot stronger of a chlorine smell, but it's it's actually dichloramines. So you have to give, um, like, a lot of kidney dialysis and fish tank owners. That's right. Yeah, it's all in, included in our um, our consumer confidence reports every year. We do mention that we um, we treat it with chloramines, and so yeah, dialysis patients and and um, people with a immune or altered immune systems probably shouldn't use our water or filter it out. Well, we're gonna go to the brewery. The brewery is a perfect example for somebody that doesn't like monochloramines in their water because it will kill your brewery bugs. It will not make beer. So they actually have to filter out the chloramines in order to make the beer. You're looking at our, our systems here. We have to monitor our water. So these are our analyzers for chlorine. Uh, permanganate, which we add at the headwater. We add the permanganate before it comes into the filters. That oxidizes the dissolved manganese that is in the river water. It also helps with our coagulation um, and gets rid of, in a, not as much as you want it to, but gets rid of some total organic carbons and helps with our treatment. Um, and we put that in after the 2016 uh, drought. Downstairs is also, it, we have a basement, so you're sitting on a tank here and a tank there. It has a window going from one to the other, but there's also pumps. Our pumps are in the basement, so we have two finished water pumps that push the water up about 350 feet up to the standpipe that's um, on Pine Hill Road, and we got a couple um, of our raw water pumps which pull the water from the river and put it, push it up into our filters. Neato. This is this is our finished water. This is what we're putting into the filters. So, anybody says we don't filter our water well, eh. <laughs> I, I beg to differ. <laughs> but yeah, that's that's what we do. This is this is raw water. This is um, it probably has some permanganate in it, and um which can add a little color only because it's oxidizing the manganese. So the manganese comes out a kind of a reddish or blackish color. What's your guys' dose? For what? Uh, Popping right now, we're dosing about four parts. We've gotten up to eight parts without any residual in the, in the um, filters. So very high, um, a very high manganese. Um, and the organic matter dose. is really requires, um, you have to meet that demand too, in order to oxidize the manganese. Yeah, the manganese that ends up getting oxidized last. First is the TOCs, and then, and then the iron, and then the manganese. So we're dealing with all of those things in this water here. And as you see, you can tell the solids here, you know, those, 
I pulled it out of a pipe that doesn't get used much, so you're probably not going to see that in our raw water so much. Um, it just happens to be where I took it from, but it gives you a great idea of, of what we're working with. So my name is Tyra Jacobs. I work for the U.S. Environmental Protection Agency's Drinking Water Program, and as I mentioned earlier, we have our Salmon Falls Action Plan, so if anybody's interested in getting a copy, and I wanted to introduce you this afternoon to our host here at Teetotaler Cafe, Emmett Soldati, who is the owner, founder and owner, and he's going to tell you a little bit about his background and his story and his connection to Summersworth. And I think I reached out to Emmett about seven years ago when you were with Levin. <laughs> yes. And talked about how to partner with the local business to learn more about how we can promote or educate the citizens of the region about um, the Salmon Falls River and how it's used for drinking water. So thank you for hosting us. Yes, thank you, Kyra. And thanks everyone for coming out to Teetotaler, crossing the bridge. It's very important, being a good neighbor. Uh, as Kyra said, my name is Emmett Soldati. I'm the owner, uh, founder, proprietor here at Teetotaler. We've been in business for eight years in downtown Summersworth. Uh, I grew up in Summersworth. I was born and raised just up this hill. Uh, and my love of the community and of the city uh, and the surrounding communities is what brought me back to Summersworth eight years ago. So I actually started my journey in Summersworth running for city council and caring a lot about local issues. Uh, and I lost that race eight years ago, which is why we have Teetotaler. Um, so it was a good, it was a good loss. Um, and now I'm able to use Teetotaler to highlight municipal uh, and state related issues in a different way. So uh, we've done a lot of work um, together and with PrEP and other organizations highlighting our drinking water and highlighting the Salmon Falls River as one of the most threatened water supplies that um, makes your tea and makes your chai and makes your lattes. Right. Mike Babinski yeah. is right. the DPW director and he can introduce his staff and tell us a little bit more about our next stop on the tour. But I just want to say thank you so much for being such a great partner and we're so grateful to the city of Summersworth. You've been with us since 2009 yeah. when we put in the first application for the seed grant for this project. So we could not be more thrilled to have new faces, <coughs> new partners at the city of Summersworth. So thank you so much. And um, I'm going to turn it over to you to introduce yourselves, your staff, and then the next part of the uh, tour. Hey, that's part of it. Great. Well, thank you very much. So again, I'm Mike Babinski. Uh, the Director of Public Works and Utilities for the City of Summersworth. And I appreciate that uh, brief introduction and uh, certainly some staff even before me had been involved with championing um, the Salmon Falls watershed and the importance of it and the protections uh, that we are working through as well as our own water resources for ensuring not only current economic growth but sustained growth into the future. With me this afternoon is Gary LeMay. Gary's our city engineer. Uh, joined us about a year ago and part of our team doing uh, an outstanding job of helping us move a lot of projects forward uh, in terms of our infrastructure. We'll talk a little bit about that as well as it relates to water resources in general. And also Robin Comstock, our economic development manager, is with me this afternoon. Uh, we will be taking a tour after our very brief remarks about a couple of key projects that I think are important to this group. Uh, we'll be, uh, Robin will lead us on a downtown tour of uh, some of the downtown improvements that we've made over the few years and then we'll be mentioning a couple of examples of some complete street work that we'll, we are planning on at this time. Over the last couple of years we did an assessment of the wastewater treatment plant. We did a, what's commonly called a facility update. We looked at all of our needs, both uh, some older equipment and current demands on, on the system and identified about four or five major areas of improvement uh, that the treatment plant needed. And ultimately that report identified about $30 million of improvements ranging from top priority all the way to low priority. And among our top priorities was to address some of our sludge dewatering, our aeration equipment, and then actually constructing a third second clarifier before all the flow goes out into the Salmon Falls. All in the effort to maintain our clean water standards, our discharge permit, and to meet some of the current growth that Robin is assisting the city with uh, promoting. We also recently uh, went through Conservation Commission and, and we will be going through the planning board. This The third second clarifier I mentioned on the treatment plant will actually be in the floodplain as well as um, there's some impact on woodlands and impact on shoreland protection zones and we had to go before 
Conservation Commission for uh, seeking approval of those things. And right. So um, there's there's a number of other resources related projects we have going on within the city. Uh, the first one, probably most uh, notably going on all over the seacoast and the state, is a lot of our MS4 stormwater work. Uh, there's a new permit that was issued, I think, about two years ago now. Um, and the city's yeah. been working to come into compliance with that, doing a lot of uh, uh, developing a stormwater management plan and doing a lot of different components that have to do with, uh, you know, just looking at the entire stormwater system. As we, as we all know, everything that lands on the ground here ends up in the Salmon Falls River. So MS4 stands for uh, Municipal uh, Separate Storm System, I believe. Mm -hmm. Yeah, thank you. And um, what that basically means is it's th that covers the drainage system within the city. So again, whenever it drains, a lot of the roofs in the downtown area, the drainage from the streets, parking lots, and everything else ends up in that storm system, which ultimately outlets into the river. Um, and that kind of ties in a little bit to the second component I was going to talk about, which is our Complete Streets program. Uh, that's taking a very, and, and Mike, pitch in if I'm missing anything, but it's yeah. a holistic look at the entire street, not only just rebuilding the road, but taking a look at the water and sewer and stormwater utilities that are underneath that road, along with the sidewalks, the street landscaping that goes with it as well. Um, there's a lot of different pieces that go with that. Uh, and I think for this group here, the most uh, relevant part would again be the stormwater piece of that. We are not only taking a look at the size of the pipes and how everything is able to handle it, but ultimately, uh, what if any treatment needs to happen to that water as it then heads down towards the river and ultimately again outlets into the Salmon Falls, which we all have a strong interest in uh, keeping clean and making sure is, is healthy. Uh, we are currently also looking at supplementing that with uh, potentially looking at redeveloping a, a, a well field out off of Rocky Hill Road. That would again still be drawing from the Salmon Falls watershed, just looking to supplement our water source and uh, also taking a look at, uh, again, more of a complete look of our water distribution system. I think with that, Robin, do you want to kind of give us a little background on the improvements downtown and some sure. of the things you're working on, and sure. we'll get ready for the tour. So today, let's fast forward to today, what do the rivers mean, what does water quality mean, and um, what are all the points that you have to consider in your work in terms of bringing stakeholders along with you. Today, rivers have, as 20 years later, a whole different perspective. We now understand their aesthetic beauty. We understand their geographic importance. They understand the importance to the quality of life. We need water to live. We may be, uh, we are a flawed species as human beings. We may be slow students, but we know that we need water to live. And these rivers are that source and their connection and interconnection. Um, the employers think that the rivers are very important, and again, the larger reason why I'm here, because the effect of the aesthetics of community, as well as the flow of infrastructure, whether it's recreation, drinking water, or just physical beauty. And employers do appreciate that, like I have to say, um, they didn't 20 or 30 years ago. An employer that's located near a quality water system that's also beautiful, can attract more employees, can sell and produce better products, and can have more impact on the community. So in economic development, it's more important than ever. We have time for questions, or because we, we kind of rattled through kind of three major pieces of our presentation. But was, did you have a question? Yeah. Now, you and I might know it, but uh, people in the room might not know that the dam over here was privately owned. Yeah. The people that um, took care of it are, have decided not to renew their permit. And I'm wondering if you have any plans in the future or working with Berwick on getting um, an investor or a company in here to maintain that dam because it's so important to our drinking water. Uh, facilities. Yes. If we were to lose that, it would lower the level of the river. Right. And we might not be able to use it like we do now. Absolutely. Uh, the um, so now it's a Clara. It used to be GE that uh, um, runs the uh, hydro that they're interested in decommissioning or getting out of re not renewing their license. Um, Gary's got some little more information he can elaborate on here in a second, but I would just say that while that is going through. Uh, we, we did have discussions with uh, Clara with regard to what does it mean to the river? What does it mean specifically to our intake? And in turn, Berwick's intake, because we're right next to each other with regard to where we draw water. And to the extent that they decommissioned the hydro, maybe disassembled the dam, that may, that may affect the flow of the river as well. And, and that may affect the 
um, the, our ability to draw water in the location that we're drawing, and that may be other expenses in terms of re realigning, reassigning where that intake is. We don't know uh, in terms of if anybody else is interested in picking up that license. Um, and there, I think there's some pieces of their infrastructure that they actually may keep. And the other pieces, they might, I don't know if you want to elaborate. Yeah, yeah, I can give some of the, some of the more boring details that go along with that. Um, at this point, the background on this site is that uh, back when it was still GE, I think it was 2011, um, that was the last time that that hydro actually operated and ran. Um, I believe it was related to some sort of a penstock failure. Penstock being the large pipe that carries the water at the end of the canal down to the powerhouse before it goes back into the river. Um, so our understanding is that that large <coughs> penstock has failed, has been for a number of years. It's been, I guess at this point, about eight years since it last ran. Mm. Um, Aclara decided it was not economical for them to fix it and bring it back into operation. So at this point, um, they filed to surrender their license with the federal government. And uh, the latest that we know at this point is that there was um, another interested operator that has filed on that site to take that site over, but we don't know what that would mean as far as maintenance of the dam. Anyway, we also thank you guys for um, having us here too. We appreciate it. We're going to start a walking tour. I'll try and give you um, whatever uh, I have in terms of background information and we'll see where the journey takes us. Let's obviously keep this so informal and have conversations along the way. Um, I'll show you General Electric. You'll see that white building on oh, the yeah. right oh, and now it's a clear. Yeah. Beautiful. Yeah, isn't it? I'm going to try and walk in the shade for one of our objectives is to eventually have a river walk. The property owner for the mill that we'll see in a second um, is very supportive of that concept, so we're in very early conversations about that. So go ahead. As you redevelop here, are you fixing um, the drainage system here so it cut down on stormwater going to the river, like uh, rain gardens, things like that, open bottom catch basins so it can into the ground, the ground. Yeah, uh, the, I don't know if you could hear the question. He's asking, are we working about drain water and water catchment and rain? Use your words. Open bottom catch basin. Open bottom catch basin. Are we thinking about all of that? Mike, I'll let you jump into that. And Gary, could I? Could you hear the question? Can they come up next to you? Yes. Oh, here you, here you go, Mike. Yeah. Um, as, as part of our um, Stormwater discharge permit requirements, we're constantly looking at ways where we can um, either through low impact development or other kinds of alternative design, um, remove sediment, remove, remove pollutant loadings from, the, run, uh, from the, the runoff. And those kind of devices, I don't believe we specifically have looked at on a regular basis, but we're looking at things like rain gardens and tree box filters, swales, and we have to look at it at the municipal level. My colleagues in, in the field of uh, public works management is the maintenance. How well, how easy, how well, how affordable are those structures able to be maintained? And so uh, we're constantly learning. I know the UNH uh, Stormwater uh, Center is also helping us uh, with a, a wide range of applications and ideas and we're pushing them from the practical end. So how do we maintain that? How do we maintain a rain garden that, that you know, can function, but then also doesn't look aesthetically pleasing to the neighborhood? It, it, we are looking at, at pervious surface. Um, I, I think uh, the, the cost of those applications are pretty high. The maintenance on that is still challenging. Um, I've seen it applied in parking lots, maybe trails.
All right. I get, <laughs> Hi, I'm, I'm Tom Gilmore. I'm with Great Works Regional Land Trust. I've been on the board for eight or nine years and I'm currently serving a, a two year term as, as president. And I'm also a, an early uh, patron of, of Corner Point Brewing here. Um, I heard that they were gonna be opening, uh, God, six, six or eight months before you opened. Uh, yeah. ja Jamie started a, a Kickstarter campaign and I thought, great, this is gonna, because I lived down the road in North Berwick, this was gonna be my local pub and I wanted to uh, contribute to it. And uh, so I kicked into your Kickstarter and uh, about 11 months ago, Corner Point opened and uh, I'll let Jamie talk about what happened since then, but it's uh, been an outstanding success of another small business. Um, just uh, to introduce Jamie Blood, uh, the uh, owner, brewer, and developer of Corner Point Brewing. Jamie grew up in, in Berwick. It's a small town community. Uh, I worked with his mother on the shipyard and uh, now still get to harass her when she's tending bar here. So it, it's, it's a great comfortable place to, to come in. And, uh, and so Jamie as a, as a user of the Salmon Falls water, uh, totally applicable to the Salmon Falls Collaborative. And today, Jamie, we've been to um, the, a farm that's been conserved at the headwaters of the Salmon Falls River. Um, and I've forgotten the name of it already. In Milton, New Hampshire, Branch Hill Farm. Uh, we stopped at the Berwick uh, water plant to listen to Starr and her co-workers talk about uh, the process of getting water out of the river and into the pipes down, down to you. And so you can talk about what you do with it then. Sure. How's everyone's day been? Better now. Hot, long. <laughs> well, thank you all for thank you all for coming. Um, yeah, right. How far do you have to walk back? City Hall. A block. City Hall. Oh, that's not that far. That's good. That's good. Have a few more. You won't even know. You'll swim back. Well, thank you all for coming. Uh, I'm not very good at speaking, so I'll I'll, I'll wind through my story. But um, as Tom said, I grew up here in Berwick. Fast forward six years and. Uh, we moved back here to Maine, and we live we live in York, and uh, we were actually looking kind of on the seacoast area for a for a place, small place like this, and we were only back here a month, and uh, there was a story in Seacoast Online written about Berwick was the town beer could save, and uh, it was that was pretty much it. I never I stopped looking everywhere else. Um, I contacted uh, Mr. Eldridge the day after, and we started looking at different buildings and. Going through this, I started writing the business plan, and same thing. Fast forward another two years, we had solidified. We got this building taken care of, funding, all that stuff. Um, that was when the Kickstarter rolled into, into play, and 13 months worth of renovation, we did it all ourselves, and uh, you know, voila, we opened. So, and it's been a whirlwind ever since. Uh, the, no breaks whatsoever, and uh, it's been great. The community's been great way better than we expected you know i mean you can see tom drinking from his mug and we've got 200 mugs on the wall and we've got 42 people on a waiting list and uh i had anticipated 25 to 50 mug club members by our first year so we're well over that um we've had people show up to help we've had people walk by when we were doing the renovations and came in and grabbed a hammer and started putting walls together with us and it's just been great and um you know Berwick's kind of near and dear to me anyway. Um, but that's kind of the story of Corner Point Brewing. Uh, so when we first found this building, I took a sample. There was, was nothing in here. I was literally had to crack open a pipe in the back and uh, fill a jug and bring it down to a water testing just to have it tested to see kind of where the guideline was, where the baseline was. So we had the water tested. And then I had a spreadsheet for what I wanted for brewing water. And I brought it back to the to the place we had to test it over in Wells, and it wasn't that far off. I mean, some things were a little out of whack, but it wasn't that bad. Um, so, in reality, all we needed to add to the water um, to get it within at least manageable to where I didn't really need to do a lot to it was just a couple of charcoal filters, which is also rare. A lot of times I was, I had already budgeted in like a 
$5,000 water treatment, blah, blah, blah. So we only had to add the charcoal filters. I change them. Um, usually I will rotate them every month. Um, recently I've rotated them a little bit more, um, but I gauge it. And don't let that scare you. The first one in line, the actual canister is uh, stained. So what was out of whack that you wanted to fix with the filter? So the overall hardness was low. Well, with the filter? No, before filtration. What are you trying to try? So there was, um, I'm trying to think of what the, I've got the lab reports here. What actually was out of whack? And Jamie, we have very soft water. So yeah, so the fluoride, the fluoride was a little low. Um, lead, arsenic, I mean, but those were so low, but obviously in the brewing world, you want zero. So there wasn't, there wasn't like a ton out of whack. Um, it was more so it was more so just to take whatever was left in there and get it out. It's when I put grain in the like the optimal level is like five four to five six so we'll drop it most of the beers anything lighter will actually raise your pH a lot of the darker grains will actually drop your pH um, so you can mess around um, with kind of how that all plays when you're making a beer but we add the 5-2 stabilizer, and then depending on the style, which it doesn't really come down to like the actual IPA, you know, Pilsner style. It basically comes down to whether you want your beer dry or you want it more malty, the, the sweetness to come out. So if you want it drier, we'll add a little calcium sulfate to it, which both of them lower the pH, calcium sulfate or calcium chloride. They'll, they'll both drop the pH a little bit, but one will actually dry the beer out, one will actually keep it sweeter. But other than that, I mean, it's, it's you know, like we said, that the water is the, uh, the most critical point. So, you know, if we're fortunate enough to expand, which we're working on, um, and we double and triple and quadruple our capacity, or we are, knock on wood, very fortunate enough to actually, you know, keep our facility here, but find a production facility, which is even bigger, um, it's, that's even more critical. I mean, we're, ta we're talking, you know, thousands and thousands of gallons of water a week that we would be using. But yeah, so I usually, Tuesdays are usually always a brew day because we're closed. Um, starting probably in mid to late September, it's not going to matter because we're going to open on Tuesdays, so we'll be open seven days a week. Um, but I usually get here around seven and I'm usually done brewing by three. So, um, you know, come fall, winter, spring, um, it's not much of a big deal. If it's super hot outside and super humid, it could be, it'll be 100 degrees in here. I've been brewing and there's been just condensation coming down the windows and the doors and I just shut the AC off because it's, by then it's just dying. Um, you know, so it's, it's actually comfortable in here right now because I had everything open trying to cool it off before you guys got here. But it was warm earlier. Sure, it's a, just a, it's a really light blonde ale, which is just kind of keeps a little bit of a sweetness in it. That's what a blonde ale is. And then the difference with it is I cold condition it with um, pinon coffee beans, Biscochito pinon coffee beans from New Mexico. Um, so it gives it almost, if you closed your eyes, if you're a stout person, if you closed your eyes and took a sip, you'd probably think you were drinking a dark beer. Because um, you, get, you get notes of vanilla, um, cinnamon, a little bit of anise, and a little coffee flavor, a little nut from the pinon. Yep, but it is, it is yeah, it's our top seller. Um, after that, it actually bounces up and down between the Ridland Road Brown and the Down the Hatch. Down the Hatch has been our number uh, number two for quite some time. So I have a five, and we can walk out there too. I have a five barrel brew house, so I, it's 155 gallons. A barrel's 31 gallons. So I do 155 gallons at a time. Um, some specialty beers, I'll do a half batches, so I'll do 77 gallons. Um, I'm yielding after you... You know, you, you lose some of the, the liquid in the grain, you lose some of it in what's called hop troop, which is just once you dump hops <coughs> in a boil kettle, we, we will whirlpool and at the end, everything kind of cones at the bottom. So any liquid that's left in there. Um, and then anything from the yeast when we keg and down the drain and sampling and everything, I'm yielding about 140 to 145 gallons per batch. There's two big hop farms um, that I know of in in the New England area. Um, there's one in Mass called, uh, I think it's called Four Star, Four Leaf, Four Leaf Hop Farm. Um, and then there's the hop farm in Gorham, Maine. So, yep, so we do a lot of business with the hop farm. Um, the downside to hop farms in New England is they, they're 
extremely limited on their varieties because a lot of varieties just don't grow good here. Um, so they'll do stuff like Cascades, Centennials, Nugget, like those are real hardy, kind of been around a while. Um, but whatever variety of hop that I need that I can't get from the hop yard, um, they are partners with Crosby Hop Farms out in Oregon. So I have contracts with Crosby, I have contracts with Willamette Valley, which is in Willamette Valley, um, and then with the hop farm. So between the three, I can get pretty much anything I want. My name is Andrew Madison. I'm the Source Protection Coordinator with the New Hampshire Department of Environmental Services. For me and for us, this experience and this event basically highlights the importance that partnerships play in protecting shared resources, and in this case, that's drinking water. Our friends and our partners across the river working with us to ensure that we can respond effectively to an emergency on the river and ensure that we're both taking actions to protect quality in the river, ensures high quality of life for both residents on both sides of the river. It's a win-win, and we want to celebrate that win-win here today. I'm Melissa Paley. I'm the water keeper for the Great Bay Piscataqua Estuary. And the Great Bay Piscataqua Estuary is the network of rivers and bays that make the seacoast region such an amazing place to live, to work, to play. Um, and the Salmon Falls is one of the major rivers that flows into this system. Uh, it's the, the water supply for many communities. Uh, it's the state line between New Hampshire and Maine. And the work that's going on around the Salmon Falls is really critical to maintaining a healthy estuary as well as a healthy source of drinking water for all the people in this part of these two states.